Live NFL trivia every Tuesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge and have a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. Mike Dicka is one of the more memorable coaches in the history of the NFL. And in his 11 seasons with the Chicago Bears, there were a lot of great moments where Dicka essentially made himself love to the point where he will never have to buy another drink in that city. He won over 63% of his games, and had the Bears above 500 in 7 of his 11 seasons in charge. There was a stretch during the mid-1980s where Dicka's Bears won 34 out of 37 regular season games, and where it seemed like the Bears were almost untouchable. And of course, you had the win at Super Bowl 20 where his 15-1 team, regarded by some as the greatest team in NFL history, became the first team in Bears history to make a Super Bowl, and to date, the only team in franchise history to win the Super Bowl. However, he was not a perfect coach. He did screw up from time to time. And at least from an on-the-field perspective, perhaps none are as egregious as a 1984 game that he had against the Dallas Cowboys. In front of a packed house at Soldier Field, Dicka made a series of really questionable decisions, and completely let the game get away from him for seemingly no reason. Or at least, no reason that makes a whole lot of sense. And in the 228 games that Mike Dicka coached across all competitions, this is the story of the worst one of them all. Before I break down the calls in question, we need some context leading up to the play calls, and where we were in this game. It's September 30th, 1984, and the Dallas Cowboys are traveling up north to the Windy City to take on the Chicago Bears in a critical NFC matchup early in the season. Chicago leads the NFC Central at 3-1, and, and Dallas is tied for the NFC East lead at 3-1. and one. This could be a battle for supremacy in the conference, and everyone knew it. When John Madden and Pat Summerall are on the call, you know that this game means something. The game starts off with Chicago's defense doing what it does best, and stopping Dallas in its tracks to force a 3 and out. Except on the ensuing punt return, it was fumbled by Jeff Fisher, giving the Cowboys the ball. Fisher would never play in the NFL after that 1984 season due to his fumbling problem, and we would never hear from the man again. Dallas wound up converting the mistake into three points thanks to the good field position. However, Chicago would answer immediately, as on their first drive, they would find the end zone following a Jim McMahon touchdown run from 16 yards out. That's the good news. The bad news was that the lead was immediately relinquished. On the first play from scrimmage, Tony Dorsett fields a simple screen pass. What no one realizes is that he's about to play pinball with the entire Bears defense and somehow find the end zone for a 68-yard touchdown. This has been an action-packed game so far, with three scores on the first three drives, as the Cowboys lead it 10-7. And before Dallas can even breathe, Chicago strikes right back. They get into Cowboy territory on this beautiful run by Walter Payton, who will play an absolutely critical part in our story later on. And four plays later, Payton does this. He keeps his balance, stays in bounds, and scores from 20 yards out. Chicago now leads it 14-10 in an absolutely bonkers game so far. Four scores in four drives. Want to make it 5-5? Five because that's exactly what happens when Timmy Newsom punches it in from two yards out on Dallas' next drive to give the Cowboys a 17-14 lead. And while the first half would slow down just a tad, with Chicago missing a field goal and Dallas going three and out, when the Bears got the ball back, they eventually found themselves in a beautiful situation. They're inside the red zone, and they've got 55 seconds left with no timeouts. Time is obviously not an issue. It's a golden opportunity to, at the very least, go into the halftime break with a tie, and possibly even have the lead if you play your cards right. What follows is the start of an absolutely atrociously bad game for Dicka and company. Here we go. On first down, the Bears give it to Walter Payton. Alright, no problem with this to start things off, especially since time isn't a huge issue, and he's been feasting on the Cowboys all day, with over 100 rushing yards to his name. Second down, with the clock still running since they're all out of timeouts, and they go to Payton again? Really? Now you've left yourselves in a complete bind. You're only going to have one play left to score a touchdown. Maybe two plays if you're lucky. If something goes horribly wrong on third down, like a sack or a receiver not being able to get out of bounds, you're going to walk away empty-handed and trail against the team that had won their last 13 games when leading at the half. Not the team you want to mess around against. And sure enough, you can guess what happens next. Jim McMahon throws this pass to Willie Gold, and the clock runs out, with the announcers completely perplexed and the fans rightfully booing. There is so much that is wrong with this sequence, so we're going to break it down. Number one, why was this the third down play? The risk-reward isn't there. The reward if you get it, and Galt steps out of bounds, is that Galt is still well short of the first down. You move up an extra two yards on the field goal attempt. Are those two yards really that important? It takes it from a 30-yard field goal to a 28-yard field goal. Now, two yards when talking about a 50-plus yard field goal can make all the difference from a distance perspective. 
but two yards when talking about a kick that either way is going to be inside 30 yards? There is no point to this play. It serves no purpose whatsoever. You'd be better off just rushing the field goal unit out there on third down. And you could argue that this was a bad read by McMahon, but check out the replay. Galt was definitely the primary receiver. They had nobody going to the end zone. Why would you call a play in this situation, knowing the circumstances, and not have anyone go to the end zone? Walter Payton is lazily running a two-yard out route on the far side of the screen. You have someone else running a post route that is still well short of the end zone. And then you have Galt running that route, where he has no shot at getting a first down. Why was this the play? And better yet, why did Galt even catch the ball? This is one of those times where you absolutely should drop it. The funniest part is that after the game, McMahon spoke about this play and said he intended to overthrow Galt. That should have been the sign right there for Dickie to bench McMahon for the second half if that was supposed to be an overthrow and he wound up somehow underthrowing it a bit. Now this is no disrespect to McMahon as he was playing this game with a broken bone in his throwing hand, but this should have been the sign to say that he couldn't throw it anymore. Dickie didn't speak about this play after the game, but this play was a massive turning point. And the crazy part is that this was not even close to the worst decision that Dickham made during this game. Yes, it gets worse. Because in the second half, well, just prepare yourselves. Before I talk about what happened in the second half, here are some thoughts on that previous situation by John Madden, who thought that Dickett's clock management at the end of the first half was, shall we say, less than ideal. Well, then at the half, I really felt that they didn't do a good job there, that maybe running the first one to Peyton was okay, but I think they had a pass on second down. And then on that third down, if you're going to throw the ball, you have to get it out of bounds or in the end zone. You can't complete a pass and then let the clock run out. Walter Payton is one of the greatest running backs of all time, and I think that goes without saying. And to start off the 1984 season, he was producing at a high level yet again. Through the first four games, he had 466 rushing yards on over 5.3 yards per carry. He was not only looking to carry that momentum into the Cowboys game, but possibly break the record in that game for most career rushing yards. He entered this game with 12,091, while Jim Brown was atop the NFL leaderboards at 12,312. Payton needed 221 rushing yards to break the record, which is an unbelievably lofty task. But if anyone can do it, it's him. Sure enough, he goes out there in the first half and dominates Dallas's front seven. At halftime, Payton already had 130 rushing yards on 20 carries, which comes out to an average of 6.5 yards per carry. Amazingly enough, at halftime, he was actually on pace to break the record. Payton entered this game averaging an amazing 4.6 yards per carry lifetime against the Cowboys, and as impressive as that was, he was smashing that today. Of his 20 carries, none of them went for negative yardage, and only one of them didn't get any yards at all. He had 5 runs of at least 12 yards, with an additional 2 runs going for 9 yards. On his final 14 carries of the half, he was averaging 8.4 yards per carry. Dallas did not have a good run defense. They finished the 1984 season 24th in the league out of 28 teams in rushing yards allowed, and 23rd in yards per carry. They were coming off of a game against the Packers where they allowed 4.5 yards per carry, and that was against fairly pedestrian players like Jerry Ellis, Harlan Huckleby, and Jesse Clark. And here was Walter Payton, the greatest running back of all time arguably, tearing a bad run defense to shreds. So after that amazing first half, and knowing that his quarterback had a broken bone in his throwing hand, what does Dicka decide to do? He decides, for some inexplicable reason, to abandon the run entirely. And safe to say, it did not go well. At all. That amazing first half that Walter Payton had, turns out, in the eyes of Dicka, it meant absolutely nothing. Dicka saw that first half and decided that it would be in Chicago's best interest, with an injured McMahon, to throw the ball. And even after McMahon got pulled in the fourth quarter because he physically couldn't go anymore due to injury, and even after Rusty Lish entered the game, a man with one touchdown and seven interceptions in five seasons, with a completion percentage of under 43%, and a career passer rating of 27.1, which is worse than if he did nothing but spike the ball to the ground on every single play, they still decided not to feed Payton the ball. In the second half, Walter Payton got five carries. When after going for 130 yards in the first half, I can count on one hand how many carries one of the greatest running backs of all time got in the second half, you know that is bad. The good news for Chicago was that Payton was still having his way with the Cowboy defense, averaging 5 yards per carry. They still couldn't stop him. The bad news was that because of how infrequently they utilized him, that came out to just 25 yards. And unsurprisingly, Chicago's offense completely sputtered in the second half. The Bears had 4 drives in the first half 
resulting in two touchdowns, a missed field goal, and a red zone trip that they completely bungled. In the second half, the Bears had six drives, resulting in three punts, an interception, a turnover on downs, and a missed field goal, which comes out to a grand total of zero points. The Bears lost this game 23-14, and afterwards, all the talk was about Dicka's decision to seemingly abandon his star running back for no apparent reason. Before I talk about what happened after the game, here are some thoughts from John Madden at the start of the fourth quarter on Dicka's questionable decision to just stop going to Peyton. Once again, he was not too thrilled about the move. I'll tell you, you know, the Bears uh, are only down six points, and I'm sure that they can, you know, get back to Peyton. I, I don't think they ought to leave that. If they were, you know, two or three touchdowns down, maybe they should get away from that run. But I think I'd kind of stay with old Walter there and, uh, you know, keep pounding that thing in there because it was successful in the first half. I don't see many adjustments that the Cowboys have made, you know? Dicka clearly did not listen to Madden's advice, as after those comments, Peyton had one carry the rest of the game. Payton was asked after the game about the questionable second-half play calling, and being the class sack that he is, he did not criticize the coaching staff one bit, trusting Dicka and the staff's judgment. As Payton said, I'm not the head coach. Sometimes I get crossed up about what is going on out there. The coaches have another viewpoint, and they know what plays are best, so I just go with the flow. I don't want to second judge the coaching staff. Nine out of ten times, they're right. What did Dicka have to say about the game? He said that he felt the team had to change it up, since they couldn't constantly run on third down and make first downs. But why would you change a winning formula? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Why did Dicka fix play calling that did not need to be fixed? You have Walter Payton, one of the greatest hatbacks of all time, having a career day against a bad run defense, and you had a passing game that was not very efficient. And you abandoned that just for the sake of changing things up? Imagine if every time Derrick Henry got 100 yards on the Jaguars, Mike Vrabel and the coaching staff decided, you know, eventually, this isn't going to work. Eventually, they're going to stop us, so we might as well switch the game plan now. As happy as I would be if he did this because Henry's runs have given me cold sweats, it's absolutely stupid. Yet, that's exactly what Dicka's logic was here, and it made absolutely no sense. Obviously, Mike Dicka is a good head coach, and this game didn't have a whole lot of impact on the playoff picture for the 1984 season. Chicago still won the NFC Central, still would have played Washington in the divisional round with a win here, and Dallas still missed the postseason thanks to dropping six of their final 11 games after a 4-1 start. But if there are any moments that Dicka probably wishes he could have back, it's probably this absolutely atrocious coaching performance against the Cowboys. He had Dallas on the ropes, and with awful clock management and even worse play calling in the second half, he blew it. He tried to fix a winning formula that did not need fixing. He got too cute, and it backfired in absolutely spectacular fashion. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com, and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Monday and Tuesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL Trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JRGator9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping get the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.